So hello. Um, I realize that BBB system doesn't allow you to upload more than 200 slides. So what I end up with is actually 199 slides. And luckily, Hao and Paul actually said a lot of what I'm gonna say. So I hope I can make it in before, the, the try, I'll try to make it 135 to finish time. <laughs> all right, all right. So let's get started. So Tina, um, tri-state number, and we have this structure, data structure in the BPF registration state to track this. And it's the, mo the main kernel, lo the main logic for tnum it actually does in the tnum.c file. And I did some statistic. Turns out the bug that we have in the core tnum over the years since its introduction in 2017 by Edward Creed is actually only one. That's, that's, how, that's what I counted. Um, and the number of lines that remain unchanged since the introduction in 2017 is around 168 lines out of like 200 lines. So 75% of the code actually remain unchanged. And I, I, I think this is a testament to uh, Tinom having a good code and a good API. And in practice, though, like something different happened. So people just don't look at Tinom. Like, don't, because in kernel development, people look at your code when your code has a bug or when they try to change it. So this doesn't happen with Tinom. And instead, I want to try to introduce like people to Tina. Like people out in, in this room already said through like three or four verifier talks. So you are expert by now. And the goal of this talk is to make you even more comfortable. Um, you can start reviewing verifier patches. So let's go. So Tina, by now you know BPF verifies uh, program safety. So for that, we need to answer a different kind of question. And for that, we want to know what kind of value is used. And turns out that the verifier has to deal with BPF instructions. So in practice, like most of the value that we're trying to track are the value in the registers. And for that, we use value tracking. Otherwise, uh, so the value tracking is also like share some common background, I guess, in, with the compiler literature, you might note this as a uh, data flow analysis or range value analysis. Anyway, uh, value tracking. So the simple, naive approach of value tracking is, of course, you try to track all the possible value, but it really just doesn't work. It doesn't work in two way in memory. And also when you try to write an algorithm to track it, it really doesn't work. So by now we already know we track the minimum and the ma uh, the maximum which is the interval domain and we actually don't just track one oh let's see we don't just track one we track eight uh, four we track four pairs which are, ends up being eight and for those actually it's pretty hard to track the bitwise operation uh, with the ranges so what we end up doing is decided not to track that, we give up, like this kind of misquoting Edward Creed here, but we track individual bits. And when tracking individual bits, somehow the symbol is lost, but the bits can have three states. So just because I saw people coming in just reiterating, um, the three states can be either unknown, um, which means it could be zero, it could be one, and or it could be known to one, or the third case is that the bit is known to be zero. So as an example, we can construct um, tnum in this way. So for example, in this register, you think you could have either one or three. And to construct it, you turn it into a bitwise representation and you check the bits. So the bits at the higher precision can either be one or zero. So this means this bit here is unknown. On the other hand, on the lower bit, like both are always one. So this means that that bit we represent it by one, uh, by a known one bit. And that's actually the whole idea. Like TNUM is quite simple. Um, but to, name, to make things clearer, like naming things is actually quite important as this talk. So we call them by different name. The actual value that can happen 
that can, I guess, occur in the register, we call them concrete values. And for the TNUM, we call it an abstract value. So this is name came from the academic literature on um, abstract interpretation. So it's better if we have some name that we can reuse. Anyway, in practice, there's more bits in the register, but that's fine, it still works. And, uh, and in this case, we're tracking one and three, which is pretty cool because if you think about ranges, um, tracking minimum and maximum, you cannot track like holes between them. And this turns out to be pretty important if you're trying to track something like pointer alignment. And limitation, okay. So TNUM sounds cool, it tracks bits and tracks non-consecutive number, but there's some problem with that. It's quite fuzzy. So what I mean is that the boundary of TNUM is not as solid, not as tight as you think. So the one and three range in this case is actually like a, a good case. So when you turn this one and three um, into TNUM and turn it back again, it's actually the same thing. It's still one and three. But things doesn't always work that way. So if you try this on one and two, something different happens. So you turn one and two into TNUM, um, the higher bit is different, unknown, lower bit, different, unknown, okay. So what happens is that you actually turn, like if you try to convert this TNUM back, you get something different. So first, both bit may be on, uh, mo mo both bit may be zero, so zero. One may be set, one may be unset, and there's two ways to do that. And the third, uh, and the the fourth way is that two bit is set. So what happens? Our view need to be different. We need to look at TNUM in actually. Well, we need to look at value tracking in three ways. First, there's the ideal set of value that you want to track. Second, there's the abstract value of that ideal set. And third, there is an actual concrete set of the value you end up tracking. And this is fine, not, not great, but fine. And the reason that it's fine, because when you end up tracking more values, you are doing more track essentially. So if this so much, so many set of values still passes, then your original like real value should be fine. And this is otherwise known as um, over, over approximation in the static analysis literature. So yeah, fine. And we, the, the other reason it's fine is because we have ranges for that. So for tracking type bound, use ranges. And the, the, the other limitation is sinus. So this is actually quite similar to the last thing I've said. So the main problem is that when a value crosses sign boundary, it gets pretty difficult for Tino. And the best example we have is like, when you try to track register value with just negative one and zero, you actually end up tracking like all possible values. So you just don't know anything, which is also fine again, because we have the sign ranges. And the other thing like about TNUM and like intervals, even for interval general, is that you ch cannot track nothing. So you, um, in, in TNUM, you always think there's at least one value in your TNUM. So if there's an impossible pass that we, uh, we want to track, we, uh, if there's an impossible pass, we try to prune it. I think Paul, also, Paul or Hall, Hall already mentioned this. So in practice, this means we don't follow that branch. And this is done by the is state uh, as branch taken function in the BPF verifier. So we kind of work around that. And it can track relation, which has been said by how I, I decided to skip this part. And basically what we did is we just work around that limitation in verifier. So implementation. So far it's conceptually how the, uh, how the TNUM works, but the, our machines are not trinary, so we have binary machines. So we have to find a way to implement that on our binary machines. And what we use is two fields, 64-bit um, unsigned. The first is the, actually I'll start with the mask first. So the mask check which bit are unknown. So if that bit is set in the mask, it means that bit is unknown. 
N40 value, it checks the exact value that if we know it. So what it means is that for the concept, for the known, known bit set, we set the mass to one, uh, sorry, for the known to be set bit, um, we set the mass to zero and value to one. And likewise for the, the unset bit, we set the mass to zero because it's known and value to zero. And for unknown bit, we set, of course, set the mass to one. But in practice, we need to do a bit more than that. Uh, we ne also need to set the value to zero. And that means we actually have a fourth state, which is invalid. You cannot have your mask and the value bit both set. If that happens, like all hell go loose. So to convert uh, our TNOM example, um, it's actually also quite simple. So on a bit, have the mask set and have the value zero. Known to be one bit, have the mask on set and value set to its actual value. And so far so good. That's on the data structure side. Let's look at a few helpers. So for calculating the minimum possible of unsigned value in TNUM, it's actually super easy because of how we represent it. So you just access the value field. And for accessing the maximum possible value, it's also quite easy. So you just or the mask with the value. And the reason that works is because the masks are unknown bits. So if we assume they are all set, then uh, we can get the maximum possible value. So moving on to something more advanced, uh, T num and I think it's, it's like mentioned. So T num and how is that done? So instead of telling you, telling you how T num work, uh, T num and work, we will try to craft it from scratch instead. So how well do you know, need to know T num to craft an operator? Turns out not that much. So to get started, you actually start with your normal truth table. You first construct the table, assuming it's just like normal bit and that's easy. Everyone can do it. Just Google it. Um, so you have your truth table. The next step is you expand it a bit to include the unknown bits. And it seems scary at first, but actually to fill out that field, all you need to do is look at the field above it. So it's always zero, put in zero there, nothing difficult. And the next, you have either zero or one. So either zero or one actually just means unknown. So nothing difficult there. Um, the table is symmetric, but let's fill in the rest. And we end up with the last field, unknown and unknown. So that is a bit more challenging, but not that much. So just look at all the values in the original truth table all at once and put it in there. So voila, that's actually it. So this is how you can construct a kind of like, not, not read truth table, but tri-state table of your TNUM operation. And it is really quite easy because they're just bits and it's easy to iterate them. So the slightly harder part is how do you go from this, the conceptual view of TNUM into the implementation side. Uh, for that, we can start replacing the TNUM value, the, the conceptual value by their implementation. So first I replace the zero. So all the known zeros have the mask unset, value unset. And likewise for the known to be one bit, Mass is still zero, value is one. Unknown bits, mass is one and value is zero. And it gets a bit unwieldy, so we'll separate it out here and also remove the prefix. So it's a bit simpler. So values. Now uh, at this stage, it's actually more like playing a game of Sudoku or something. Uh, it's trying to find a formula that matches what the, the table you're trying to do. So this ends up pretty easy. You just try to find the intersection between the uh, middle row and the middle column. And that's end up 
being when the value is set on both A and B. And this makes sense, like we're trying to do tnum and the value should be n of two values, like nothing hard there. Uh, the slightly more complex part is the mask. So the mask, we have to try to select the, the lower three, uh, three cells, I guess. And this was a, a bit more difficult, but still like Sudoku. So let's just for a moment, let's assume that we want to actually select the four, like the, the, the larger box on the lower right. And to do that, it turns out that this happens on the intersection when either the mass is set or the value is set on, on both A and B. And that is actually uh, in this formula. So when the, when the value is set in A or when the, value, when the mass is set in A and intersecting with when B has the value set or when the B has mass set. So we got up this formula, but that is of course not enough because we're including this middle box there. And the way around it is just to try to minus that. So we already actually know how to find the middle box. Like this is just A value and B value. That's what we use to calculate the value before. So we just try to minus that from our current result, like geometric like, and what happened is that this can be done by another end operation with the, the a dot value and b dot value negated. And that is actually how tnum n works. Just a slight moment of confusion. So that is actually how tnum and work. If you look at tnum and this is the actual code that's used on our kernel bpf tnum.c file. It calculates the value with phi. Phi is actually a dot value bitwise n of b dot value. And that's that's what we had. Um, the mass is slightly more complicated, but we actually see the same thing. It has alpha, which is the a value or a dot mask that does that we have, and it has beta, which is b dot value or b mask, which is here. Um, lastly, it has the negated a dot value and b dot value. So there's that, and you have t num end. So. I I know I go a bit fast there because I was hoping not to go too late, but I think the point is that you really don't need to be kernel programmer to run a tnum operation. Like it's it could be very simple just by following that step and just following the logic. And I think it would be interesting to see if someone could maybe try implement a tnum signed cask. I think that could be used to simplify the uh, the sign extension logic a bit, perhaps no, like nothing guaranteed. So usage. So it turns out that we actually don't use the tnum, the far off or variable offset field that often. A lot of time we use the tnum through the bound thinking. So we use the tnum indirectly when when its tnum knowledge is flow into the range knowledge. And what we end up in the verifier a lot of time doing is just checking the range. We track the minimum range or we track the maximum range. But actually when we're tracking that, we may or may we may sometimes be using some knowledge that flow that came from tnum. All right, testing. So after going through like crafting the tnum and operation like it seems simple it seems fast like but you still don't feel like you understand tnum it's uh, you're afraid which is very reasonable and so you question yourself like does it work like is it correct is it, does what i have read is correct in terms so and when we say correct i guess we have to be more specific 
uh, we're saying that would they allow, would our algorithm allow unsafe program to pass? And BPF self-test could s help some, but of course it's not enough. The best is what we have already heard. Uh, I think uh, Agni really have very, like a, it's a great application on checking whether our value tracking algorithm works. But personally, when I'm developing, when I try to develop some operator, I actually use a more lower level. It's still using Z3, which is acne based, but it's more like uh, a poor man's acne, like, because acne still takes some time. So when I'm developing algorithm, I would prefer it to run the check maybe in second. So by reducing what checks are being done uh, with Z3 to pi, uh, I can actually have a quick iteration. And this is not my idea, this is by the, the work of the same people behind Agni. Um, that th this was their previous paper, so I just kind of copied their code. And the basic idea is that you try to check that when, you, when you're mimicking the operation in Tenum, you still end up with at least the same set of values. So what you want to check is that when you do a TNOM addition, in this case, you end up with 2468. And in the original ideal case, you end up with 468. So this is a good case. This means no, no unsafe program gets passed. And this is usually known as um, more like a sound, soundness property but that is actually not enough. Like just, uh, just preventing unsafe program to pass actually could be done very, very, very easily. Like it's super easy. Um, you just say, I don't know for every operation and like, that's it. So apparently that's not enough. And that's why uh, we also need to make sure that we don't reject safe program too often, which is, I guess, part of house talk. Um, so for that, I think BPF self test is a bit of a canary, but but I I I really don't know otherwise other than trying psyllium. Um maybe acne help. I'm not sure. Okay, conclusion. So basically, Tenum tracks bitwise pattern. It's actually quite simple. Like although not that intuitive because bit pattern is just not intuitive for our human mind, and it cannot track the min and max and the values that cross sign bounds so easily, but it has other properties that works very well. And uh, it's very important for abstract operation, uh, for value tracking um, algorithm and data structure like TNUM to make sure that no possible value are left behind. It's, it's okay to include more value if we have to. So, and that's, there are some resources on this. If you want to know more about TNUM, I recommend the first paper, um, which is a great written. That's how I learned almost everything about TNUM. And there are a few other resources I had. If you're interested on the uh, Z3 Pi script I used to check what I've written, you can try to go to the last link. And, Oh yeah, this is the last slide. I, I, I removed these I removed the thank you slide because I have too many slides. So yeah, done. No questions, looks like it. Hey, hi. So I really like the presentation and the way you present the like BPF end. Um, how crazy does it become when you try to do the same sort of tables for BPF add instead? Because you have like the carry on and stuff like this. Yeah, I, I didn't even want to try. <laughs> so I, I think it would be quite difficult. But but that's something maybe a future talk. <laughs> I'll try. Thank you. All right.